Uh, so I'm going to present on a study. This is an old study from 2001. It's actually um, one of the studies that actually um, that actually jump started and triggered this uh, this push of antidepressants actually in children and adolescents. So um, so this is uh, the efficacy of paroxetine, also known as Paxil, in the treatment of adolescent major depression. And this is a randomized controlled trial. And um, this, again, it was published in 2001. Next slide, please. So some background about paroxetine. So paroxetine is in this class of medications called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It's an antidepressant, and it's also used for anxiety. Um, what, um, what happened was is that um, some background, uh, these SSRIs actually first came out in 1988. And uh, this was the dawn of um, the start of uh, the blockbuster drugs in psychiatry, so the first of which was Prozac. So Prozac is the first uh, multi-billion dollar drug that um, has come to psychiatry, and hence um, there's been these copycat uh, drugs that's come to the market, such as Paxil, or also a generic name called Paroxetine. So, um, what happened was is that uh, there's, because of the money to be made, there's been this big push to actually find new indications for these drugs. So these drugs um, have been studied in adults, so they decided then to, the uh, drug companies and the, and the researchers decided to push into, um, into uh, children and adolescents for an indication for depression. So hence the reason for the study. So in this study, they compared paroxetine versus placebo versus um, an old treatment, which is called imipramine, so that's a tricyclic antidepressant, so it's an old treatment. So they try to compare three, these three treatment arms um, in a um, cohort to study participants that were 12 to 18, males and females. Um, so going back to some of the background, I chose this study because this study was eventually debunked in 2015 because of misleading statistical analysis. So yes, this, um, this 2001 study, although the Authors of this 2001 study say, well, the technology at the time, we didn't have, you know, the most modern, up-to-date uh, statistical methods, so um, we, can only did, we can only do the best that we can at the time. And, of course, they always say that retrospective analysis is always, um, is always uh, hindsight, is 2020. Retrospective reanalysis is also fraught with um, methodological um, problems uh, because, um, when you're doing prospective analysis, it's different from doing retrospective. So hindsight's 2020. Um, you can always, it's easier to uh, look back and to look forward. So that's actually a very good um, argument. However, the problem with this is that when this drug, th this is a positive study. They showed, they, they said that, the study showed that initially that paroxetine, Paxil, is more effective than placebo and imipramine in treating the adolescent depression. And that is how they marketed this drug. And only in 2015 did they start to debunk this. So, um, and, there's, and so there's lots of money to be made in this. And um, the problem here is that Big Pharma, when I say Big Pharma, this is like the drug companies, so Big Pharma, Big Oil, so Big Technology, this is Big Pharma. Um, and psychiatry, which also is its own cottage industry, um, for them, SSRIs were lucrative for both sides. Everyone was getting rich in this. Um, researchers, um, FDA, um, they've got a huge, the FDA, the U.S. Department of Food and Drug Administration, they actually get huge um, fees for such studies to be, to be conducted. So everyone is making money here. Um, the other problem is that Big Pharma oversees and sponsors the majority of treatment studies um, in medicine in the state. So, so, and so when, when these drugs are actually submitted to FDA for approval for a new indication, such as adolescent depression, um, the, the sponsor of the drug is usually the manufacturer of that drug. So you can see already the inherent um, conflict of interest in such um, arrangement. So there's this, so I'm bringing this study forward because it, it was, it's been debunked in the 2015 reanalysis. So there's this perfect storm of bias and greed affecting the scientific process. So, Next slide. Okay, so, so I chose this study because um, it uh, shows how statistical analysis can be gravely affected by human intervention. 
um, and due to bias from pressures of, as I mentioned, financial gain, academic fame. And also there's this, this curious thing about uh, researchers. They, um, they, they actually have this, um, there's this push to actually um, have them publish a pair. So, so there's this huge push to have a quota of publications or else you no longer have your appointment. And uh, pressure on journals, academic journals, uh, only to produce positive results. So, so when, when you say, well, how does a study like this get, get published? Well, the other, the other environmental influence is that the journals actually, they tend to just publish positive studies. No one wants to read about a negative study, right? But um, I'm, in this day and age, a negative study should be published. And if the journals won't do it, then it should get out um, in other venues. And this is actually how this 2015 um, um, study reanalysis came, came to fruition. There's been um, talk over the last 15 years since the study was performed about it was, um, researcher and practitioners have been highly critical of the study. And bowing to pressures from the, the medical community and from patient groups that have been suing uh, uh, Big Pharma over such um, studies, they finally came, came out and actually shared all of the clinical data related to studies, and hence the reanalysis occurred with the actual raw data from the study. Um, I don't have, um, I didn't have time to actually look at it, so that's, um, so in this study we had um, 275 adolescents um, were screened into the study. Uh, they were 12 to 18, males and females. They had major depressive disorder, and they were um, basically assessed by a clinician, and actually um, they, were, they were diagnosed with depression. And then they began this eight-week double-blind uh, study. So they were either on paroxetine, uh, imipramine, or placebo. So three treatment arms. There was 10 centers in the States, two in Canada. Um, so a total of 425 subjects were screened. And then 275 eventually were, um, were approved to actually um, go into each of the treatment arms. And um, of course, the study was, was was funded by GlaxoSmithKline at the time. It's now known as GSK. And um, um, Keller et al. 2001, that's the reference for the study. Next slide. So outcome measures, um, they, they, a priori, they, um, they, when they were designed the study, there was two outcome measures that they, that they said primary outcome measures that, that um, noted response to the drug. And this was the Hamilton rating scale for depression, also known as the HAMD. Um, so either there was a score of less than eight, or there was a 50% reduction from the baseline HAMD, then they would consider this um, response. Um, secondary outcome measures were blah, 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 blah. It really, secondary outcome measures just for, it's, it's just to dress it up, but really shouldn't be the focus of um, these really shouldn't be the focus of such studies. You want to focus on your primary outcome measures. However, in the after the study was published, uh, guess where they focused on? Because there was no response here. They focused here, right? So it's, again, it's poor form. Next slide. So in the power analysis, they um, um, they determine. So we've done power analysis here, he, um, here at 95% uh, confidence with a uh, alpha of uh, uh, 0.05 two tail. They needed, uh, the power analysis revealed they needed uh, 90 patients in each, in each treatment arm, so Paxil, imipramine arm, and then the placebo arm, 90 patients needed to go through each one in order to show an effect size of 0 0.4. So 0 0.4 is like a moderate effect size, meaning um, it's, it's 0.4 is a moderately, um, it's a statistic that shows moderate uh, treatment effect. And then of course, this is a two-tailed test. So the reason why this is two-tailed is that um, the null hypothesis for placebo-controlled studies is that the null hypothesis is that there, there is no treatment effect. So that's the null hypothesis. So you want to reject the null hypothesis that there is a treatment effect. Hence, um, you, want to, you want to show that it's not equal to zero. So therefore, it's two-tailed. Um, so in this study, um, we have, um, with regards to variables, we have continuous variables. And we also have categorical variables. Uh, so in this study, they, uh, they, they modeled their uh, statistics in SAS. And then they did pairwise comparisons between each treat, active treatment and placebo. So Paxil was 
paroxetine was compared to placebo, and imipramine was compared to placebo. And this was performed at an alpha level at 0.05, and the data was reported as least square means, either standard deviation or standard error. Next slide. Um, so let's see here. So here are the results. So in a study, 270, 425 got screened, 275 um, started the study, and only 190 completed. So, so there was a 30, 31% dropout rate. So that's actually a big dropout rate for a, um, for a treatment study. Eight weeks is not that long, so 31% dropout, uh -huh. mostly due to side effects. Um, so that's a, that's a big uh, red flag right there. Um, when I'm looking at studies for clinical uh, studies, I'm looking at, um, if you're looking at well-tolerated studies, you want to see like 80% or greater. But here it was 69% uh, completion, which is very poor. It's not the poorest, but it's poor. Um, so there is also um, only one of the outcome measures, primary outcome measures actually, um, was met, so, and that was the HAMD of less than eight. So, so in depression, when um, say one of you goes and gets a Hamilton HAMD score uh, performed on you, um, if you have a score of less than eight, then you're deemed to have no depression. So, and above eight, then you're you're starting to talk about clinical depression when you combine it with a clinical evaluation. Um, okay. So in this, um, oh, go back, go back to the previous slide. Please. Yeah. So here, what you see is um, two data sets, one with the uh, last observation carried forward. So you see here, you have, um, they initially started with, they were powered, right? They started with a N of 90, N of 94, N of 87, and like I said before, the power analysis stated that they needed to have at least 90 in each arm. They, they fulfilled it here at the beginning. However, they didn't have any, any wiggle room because eventually, with the um, completion of the study, there was dropouts. And here you see... Um, for imipramine, let's see, it was a proxetine, 67, 56 for imipramine, and 66, 56 for imipramine, and 66 for placebo. Um, so that in itself, it's underpowered here, as you see, because that's, that's way below 90 that you need for each, each treatment arm. So the difference between here, this is the uh, completers, and this is the, this is where they included everybody. So in the clinical trial, what they do is, although all these people started, 31% uh, dropped out. So what they did was, instead of just um, taking out the data for the people that dropped out, they just they, they, they do what's called the last observation carried forward. So the point of last contact where they measured um, variables, they just placed it in the analysis. Next slide. Um, so what do you see here is, um, this is the response. So when, when you're having a change in the AMD score, it's going down over time, that means that the press, depressive symptoms are actually decreasing. So actually, <laughs> what's uh, we're interested in, where's placebo? Placebo is square, where do you see placebo? Right there. Do you see any difference uh, when you eye it? Here's our, so when you see change in depression scores, and going down is actually improvement, what do you see? Do you see placebo actually hanging? It's hanging with placebo, with imipramine and, and paroxetine. So, so when you look at such things, I mean, come on, people, this is like, you've been fooled, look at this. This is like, you've got a high placebo response. That's the, that's the big problem here, right? So, so why this even gets um, uh, published? Um, because of the high placebo response. So if you have up to a 50, this was up to a 50% uh, placebo response. You can't, why not just give them the placebo pill if that's, if that's the case? Because the problem is that those, imipramine and Paxil have significant side effects. Uh, so when you're looking at um, the HAMD scores, this is what you're looking at. So if you're 0 to 7, it's normal. So, so they met the, the criteria for less than, less than, um, actually, they're say, here's what they're saying. They're saying this is Paxil, this is paroxetine, and the circle is paroxetine, the square is placebo. So they're saying this is statistically significant difference. So, although at a point, at an alpha of 0.05, this is statistically significant difference, clinically it has no, it has no clinical 
It's not clinically significant. It's statistically significant, but not clinically significant. And there, therein lies another problem where they don't talk about uh, treatment effects. When you're, when you're talking about treatment, now, now they do it. Now, this is 2001. That's old technology, old ways of doing things. Um, this would have been a poor study if they didn't, they didn't uh, report on treatment effects, which they didn't. So they focused on it statistically significant, but really, there's no difference. Um, you might as well just take the, the sugar pill. Next. So as I mentioned, high placebo response is a weakness. You might as well get placebo for depression if that's the case. And actually, um, there, there's, um, there's some that would say actually giving a placebo <laughs> actually um, wouldn't be a bad idea. I mean, 50% response to a sugar pill, that's actually a pretty good response. Um, also, this is um, the weakness is it's underpowered. So it needed 90 completers in each arm, and it, did, it, it, it fell way below that. So I think another reason why this, this, this study failed is that it wasn't powered adequately. If they said 90 from an each term from the onset, then you should have 90 at completion. So if you're expecting 31% dropout rate, then you should be enrolling um, um, a third more patients, right? So again, it was poorly designed, poorly carried out. Again, this is retrospective analysis. This is, I'm being critical of a study, but this is what I've been asked to do with this project. Um, there's a high dropout rate, 31%. So mo when you look at all the people that dropped out, it was actually mostly due to side effects. But people on placebo also had side effects. Um, but as we'll see from the reanalysis, actually, uh, the, uh, there's actually um, more suicidal um, behaviors on Paxil, and that's why there was significant problems with this, in addition to it being um, there's really no separation from placebo. Another weakness is that they emphasize in their marketing um, that uh, on the secondary outcome variable, so when you present, when you look at a study when they're presenting secondary outcome variables, then you go, well, why aren't you talking about your a priori um, primary outcome variables? Because it, because it showed no effect. But you can make, um, it's kind of like p-hacking. You're, you're just trying to look for any of the variables that actually actually um, have, have difference. And actually, by chance, sometimes you can find something. And that's what they focused on. Um, so only one of the, another weakness is only one of the primary outcome variables is significant. Um, so that was the less than eight. So they're saying that uh, Paxil is statistically significantly different than placebo, but it's not most likely not clinically significant, low effect size. And there's not enough to say statistically significant, so we need to calculate the report on effect size. So um, this is the, uh, um, the um, sarcastic view is that Big Pharma probably suppressed this, right? So, okay, next slide. Coming up, um, last slide. So this is the reanalysis of the study. So after huge um, pressure to actually release the raw data, they finally released it. And in 2015, this group, uh, Lenore et al., they actually did the reanalysis and actually published it in the British Medical Journal. And the reanalysis showed that Paxil paroxetine is not effective for adolescents with depression. They also found that there was an increase in harm on Paxil compared to placebo. And this included suicidal ideations and behaviors and other serious side effects. So these um, findings are in stark contrast on these findings are in stark contrast to the original 2001 Paxil study, 329 which published its findings in the leading medical journal for child and adolescent psychiatrists. That's the journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. And they deemed it that Paxil was both safe and effective for adolescent depression. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you.